So this is going to be a story of some incredible birds, my long journey with them, and how James Bond might just have helped us save them. But the story begins at WWT headquarters at Slimbridge, where I found myself surrounded by scientists with spreadsheets and big maps on big screens. And the story they were telling me was fairly depressing about the drastic decline of the Buick Swan. For example, in countries like the UK, 90% of their wetlands have gone. And one in three of the birds living today has got gunshot wounds of some kind. And over time, in fact, the last 20 years, we'd lost almost, uh, almost half of them. But the really depressing thing for the scientists is that of all the people that could do something about it, none of them seemed to be listening. And so the scientists uh, were, were drafting plans to start writing letters to people all across the flyway. And their question for me was, how could I help? Now, I looked at it all and I thought, there is no way that writing letters is going to work, certainly not fast enough for the Buick Swan, because that depressing story that we were trying to tell them is one they probably didn't want to hear. And so my attention drifted across to the maps on the wall and to a swan called Hope, who, with her GPS collar, was appearing as a small uh, dot up in the Arctic. And that dot was slowly inching west towards us because she had just set off on migration. And I started to imagine, what must that journey be like? From the land of the polar bear and the reindeer breeders, across the tundra and the thick forests of the taiga, across vast farmlands, wind farms, stormy seas to the UK, and all of that while with the icy Arctic winter on her tail. And so the slight problem I then had was to figure out how on earth to get the swans to tell it. I thought on it for ages and eventually realized that the only way you could do it is to fly with them, and the only way that you could do that is in a paramotor. Now, I know what you're thinking, that does look like a ridiculous plan. It is, in fact, in effect, hanging from a big handkerchief with a big fan strapped to your back. Um, it clearly isn't meant for international travel, but it does have some uh, redeeming features. One of those is, that uh, you can fly at about the same speed and same altitude as the birds. You take off and land on your feet. So I could basically go and speak to anybody anywhere along that flyway, uh, even where there's no, no roads and, and no runways. And so I looked at it for a while and I thought, no, nah, that's ridiculous, and I sat on it. Eventually, I had the courage to, um, to write it up and send it off to the researchers, and I got back the response that I expected followed by a response that I didn't expect. <laughs> so at this point, I had no choice but to figure out how on earth to pull off this totally mad idea. And there were several things that the researchers at that time didn't actually know. Uh, one of those was that every single paramotorist had told me that it was impossible, well, every single sensible paramotorist. And the second thing was that... I had absolutely no idea how to convince the Russians to let me fly across five of their <laughs> heavily guarded border regions, uh, following the swans and with lots of cameras. And the other thing they didn't know was that several years beforehand, I'd found myself in a terrifying uh, flight in a small plane in which we'd been sucked up into thunderclouds, hit by lightning and hail, thrown around so violently that even the pilot thought we weren't going to make it. And that had left me with a debilitating fear of turbulence. And on this journey, there was going to be a lot of turbulence. So I hope you'll have some sympathy uh, with me when uh, I show you that I found myself several months later having to pass this particular test. This is an exercise to figure out if I could handle the worst that the, wing, that the weather could throw at me. The aim of the exercise is to catch the wing before it flies underneath you and you fall into it, wrapping yourself up and making it impossible to throw your reserve. So if any of you are thinking, there is no way you could do that, uh, if it hadn't been for the swans, there's no way I would have done it either.
Thank you. So fast forward now to autumn 2016. I was up on the Russian tundra in the Arctic, uh, supposed start of my expedition, and the swans were about to leave. But I still didn't have my permissions <laughs> to fly across the Arctic. And so my Russian fixer said to me, you know, Sasha, do you know anyone else that could be influential? It's great that you've got Sir David Attenborough and Sir Ranulph Fiennes as patrons, but do you know what the Russians really love? James Bond. And I've noticed that your last name is Dench. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> believe it or not, with a bit of research, it turns out I am related to Judy Dench, just uh, slightly. My great-great-grandfather is her great-grandfather, but I'm from the second illegitimate wife, a, a Bessie from Battersea. And so, <laughs> so I found myself explaining this to her agent and then to her herself, and she agreed to send us some supportive words. And, uh, and with that, I also got my response back from the, from the Russians, which went something like, we cannot give you permission, but with a few conditions, we won't stop you. And good luck to you and the swans. And with that... I was off. And so when the first, the first uh, GPS collared bird set off on migration, I could join her. And so I want for a moment all of you to imagine just what it's like crossing the Russian Arctic, trying to get inside the world of the swans. So sit back in your chair and imagine you can feel the reassuring hum of the motor and propeller behind you. Up above you is your large fabric wing. It's about 10 metres across and fine lines connect you to it so you can feel its every move. Now look down past your dangling feet at the swirling colours of the Arctic tundra below you. You can see the odd swan family, and you can see that there's plenty of water plants still there for them to eat this late in the season. You also notice that there's gas bubbling up from some of the pools, a sign that the Arctic is thawing and changing fast, and you note all those things. And then you're straight back to scanning the horizon for bears and wolves and polar bears and anything else that might want to eat the swans or you. And if you feel really nervous, cross your ankles. It does absolutely nothing, but it's somehow reassuring. <laughs> and if you get really, really nervous, practice how fast you can reach your reserve. It's somewhere down near your right butt cheek. And then across to the right, you notice a big V formation of swans. But hang on a second. There's swans and geese flying together. And as geese can legally be shot up here, and they're louder than the swans, perhaps that's one of the reasons so many birds are getting shot. They're being shot accidentally. And then you notice that two of the birds have broken away from the group. And they're, fl and they're slowly getting closer and closer to you, and closer and closer. And just as you're about to pull a sharp left-hand turn to avoid them colliding with your lines, they tuck in behind your right wingtip, and just for a few magical minutes, you really feel like you are the human swan as the lead bird in the flock. And on we flew. Whilst the bird's main mission was to get to the next wetland site as quickly as possible, my mission was to stop and talk to people. But what would they make of me up on the tundra, this big, blonde, flying woman? Uh, and just... Just to help you paint a, bit of a, paint a bit of a picture for you of what that must have been like for them. After a couple of hours flying in the Arctic, I'm cold with blue lips, I'm shivering, I've probably got bad helmet hair, and tears and snot has probably dried in streaks down my face where I've been too busy flying to try and wipe it away. And now I know, when you land in that state, people don't see you as an invading foreigner. They grab you inside wrap you in reindeer skins, give you perhaps a warm cranberry, uh, cranberry juice to drink, maybe a slab of raw, rotten reindeer meat, and if you're really lucky, a bright pink, salty, metallic reindeer blood pancake. And then eventually they ask, so you really have come all the way here in that thing just to talk to us about swans? And with basic human curiosity as to why I care so much, they want to know more. And to be honest, that same reaction was received all across the flyway, pretty much, um, although without the reindeer, obviously. And the whole journey, uh, I found physically and mentally very exhausting. But each time somebody cried because I, a foreigner, had come all the way there to talk to them in person, or a local official promised to send out information on swans to 50,000 people in their region, or a hunter waved me off saying, it's all right, I'll make sure we don't shoot swans and they don't taste very good anyway. Uh, 
it gave me the energy to put on the 50 kilos of paramotor and survival kit and fly on. And so on I flew across the dense taiga forest, occasionally being enclosed within the fog and the cloud of the winter and being forced to make a decision between going up into cloud or down and landing in the trees. And so up and up I'd go, only to emerge about two and a half thousand feet up above the clouds, where it's so cold there's fine icicles appearing on, the, on, my, on my lines, and with the planet nowhere to be seen, on the lookout for the flocks of ducks, geese and swans that have been forced to make exactly the same decision that I had. And I was making good progress all the way, uh, until one day the volunteer media crew sat me down and said, Sasha, you know how you're always so positive and energetic all the time? Well, this is a really long expedition and it's going to get a bit boring unless there's a bit more jeopardy. Do you mind being a bit more, like, worried or <laughs> scared on camera? Uh, and at that point, lucky for them, they got, the, uh, they got what they wanted. The next day, I snapped the ligaments in my right knee on a bad takeoff, and they got the screaming, teary drama they hoped for. And if that wasn't bad enough, I, it then soon became obvious that despite lots of determination and medical tape, there was no way that I could take off and land on my feet uh, anymore. So a plan B was rapidly hatched as my engineer and some locals tied my paramotor to a set of three wheels to see if I could learn to fly like that. You can hear me saying sorry. And so I, I rolled it, and I rolled it again and again, and I just didn't have the arm strength I needed, and I really sucked. And the worst thing is that it was so embarrassing having all of that filmed and shared with the world. But as predicted, the media absolutely loved it, and, uh, and the support flooded in. But it also gave me a platform to talk about injuries to the birds in a way that people could relate to. For example, when Charlotte got sick and eventually died uh, in a blizzard, people actually wanted to hear that story. And as there was media coverage, more people sent in footage and photographs of where birds might have been dying near them. And it's grim watching, sorry for sharing it with you, but once you have public interest and you've got the, the, the footage and the photos, uh, people are kind of forced to do something about it. And so on I flew across some of the remnants of the vast wild wetlands that once were all across Europe where there are still herds of wild elk roaming that must have looked up at me and thought, what on earth? To eventually being almost home, reaching the English Channel. Uh, a moment that I'd been dreading because I was really enjoying this expedition. And as I circled up to gain to, up to three and a half thousand feet, when I saw the white cliffs of Dover in the distance, my eyes flooded with tears, so clearly it was time to go home. And it was a beautiful day, as you can see. But halfway across, the cameraman, the, a paramotorist who'd been charged with filming the trip for me, had a problem with his camera and he took his very thick glove off to try and fix it and he dropped it in the channel. And it was minus 20 degrees up there with wind chill. And so for the rest of the journey, I had him swearing in pain uh, in my ear as we were connected via Bluetooth. So needless to say, by the time I reached Dover and landed, I was feeling more stressed than heroic as the media asked me, so what does it feel like to be the first woman to cross the English Channel in a paramotor? Uh, what I really wanted to say was, I've just flown over 6,000 kilometers, and that was just like a big puddle in comparison. Um, but I think I managed to say something slightly more inspirational for them, particularly as the media had been so important for us along this whole journey. So by this moment, I, we'd received about 1,700 stories in the media, on TV and radio as well, and we'd reached millions of people, and just some of those people had done something to make a difference. And some of them had just turned up to cheer us on and cheer us up in their own <laughs> bizarre and crazy ways. Uh, but even more importantly, those conversations that all those scientists had wanted at the beginning, by bringing to life the journey of the birds all the way from the Arctic to the UK, we'd brought all that to life and we'd started all those conversations between the scientists and the hunters and the power companies and politicians, and change is now happening. And what about the birds? Well, the data, two years on, 
might now be saying something a bit different. It's too early to say, but the tide could be turning for the Buick Swan. But what's most inspiring for me on this journey, my journey with the swans, is that at a time when scientists and conservationists are sounding the alarm more and more for nature, what has become clear to me is that we can't move mountains, but if we can just figure out ways of moving and motivating enough people, then all of you really can. And lastly, if there's any of you out there who've got a big idea that everybody is telling you is impossible, just remember that people said exactly the same thing to me when I had my mad idea of following the swans hanging from a hanky with a big fan strapped to my back. Thank you. Thank you.